Gavin Newsom has just appointed LaFonza Butler to the Senate, which I think is a strategic move, regardless of where she's based. I guess she's based out of Maryland, now moved to California. She was in charge of Emily's List. Emily's List is one of the largest pro-choice, pro-Democrat PACs, lobbying groups, organizations, whatever you want to call it, especially in the last election cycle. The last election cycle, Emily's List raised over $4 million for Democratic candidates, so this is a strategic move, I think, because imagine DeSantis appointed the head of the NRA to the Senate, right? So this is a big power play because now Newsom has appointed someone who is vastly connected to all of Congress, the Senate and the House. But now we find out that this lady is also connected to Kamala Harris. So if we're reading in between the lines, it's interesting that Newsom picked such a interconnected person in the Democratic Party. I think it was honestly a very strategic and good choice. I think there's no downsides. I think the war chest she comes with, the access that she has. And now Newsom can play this off as having his own back doors to the White House. Of course, there's always rumors of Newsom running for president, Biden stepping down. This kind of makes me think that now Newsom and Kamala have even a better back channel with this lady. But what are your thoughts, Richard? What kind of research have you done on the situation? So <clears throat> I think it's a genius move by Newsom. I think it's a pretty smart move long for the Democrats that are thinking long term. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so La LaFonza Butler, her background, she has been in politics, but not a politician for decades now. And uh, in my opinion, essentially strategically fundraised her, her way in a Senate seat. And uh, as far as Newsom's concerned, you know, he had boxed himself in a corner with his statement a while ago saying that he would appoint a black female into the seat. And you have three people that are running for this seat. So you have Adam Schiff, you have Barbara Lee, and you have Katie Porter. So Adam Schiff and Katie Porter do not fit the bill of the black female. So he's not going to choose them. But he was saying that he didn't want to tip uh, the scales in the upcoming election, uh, whereas with LaFonza Butler, she's so connected. And as you point out, she's connected with the Biden administration through Kamala Harris and her fundraising efforts, but she's also connected to the Clintons. She also fundraised for Newsom himself. So this could be a little bit of payback, uh, but she fits the bill. But strategically long term, one of the things that Democrats have is they have such an old aging bench, right? And so yep. with Barbara Lee, she's 77. So if you are a Democratic strategic, uh, strategist thinking long term, you don't want Barbara Lee to get this seat because now you, you're you dealing with another Feinstein type uh, situation where you've got a decade at best, she's going to be declining in health. Whereas if you get some young blood in there, uh, Ms. Butler's only 45. Now you've got somebody that can yeah. sit for another 40 years that checks all the boxes that matter to the average Democrat voter. What skin color, what orientation? I mean, she checks it all. So I think with her, they get a three for right? Female, black, LGBT. So it's a great move for the Democrats long term. It's a great move in the short term. I think Newsom with his personality, he didn't want to deal with everyone coming out of the woodwork with their beg and their ask uh, leading up to it. And I think that's why you saw him appoint her within 72 hours, just so he could get that off his plate and not deal with it and say, hey, I kept my promise. I put a black female in this Senate seat. Mm -hmm. And for somebody with no political background, it gives her uh, the ability to kind of run as a as an interim senator and build a track record real quick so that she can throw her hat in the election as well and then have that hey i proved myself over the last year yeah i a spot on analysis what's funny is california is definitely run by a mafia i mean if you look at all the mayors i believe newsom feinstein and even nancy pelosi have all been mayors of san francisco at one point or another Right. So there's definitely like this California mafia that I kind of I talked about either on a TikTok uh, or on my last YouTube about like the connections with Governor Jerry Brown and how even Newsom and, and Pelosi are kind of quasi related or closely related. So adding and, and Newsom's a big loyalist. Right. So his last Senate pick was Alex Padilla, which helped him on his campaign trail back in like 2012 when Newsom was running for governor before he pulled out. And Jerry Brown took over the, the gubernatorial nomination. So he's definitely a loyalist, and he definitely expects that loyalty back. What will be interesting about this new senator he's appointed is, okay, so she's supposed to only be interim. But now think of 
because she, her Emily's list has donated to all these congressmen and senators, she's, I'm sure, going to rack up every endorsement she needs to maintain that position because they all owe her favors. She's given them all money, right? So I think she's going to be a lasting power holder. And just the, the connections and resources she has, I mean, it's so blatantly political play for play. I just... To me, it's a very scary move in the sense that she probably is a powerful person to have on your side. How that kind of comes into play with the current Democratic presidential election and, and what they're going to do with Biden, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. And I'm always looking at different ways. Maybe I'm just out of my mind, but I'm always trying to figure out, OK, are these Democrats actually going to get rid of Biden? And if they do, they have a Kamala problem. So I was thinking for a little while, oh, maybe Newsom appoints Kamala to the Senate or, you know, is Biden going to try to get Kamala on the Supreme Court? Maybe that's not going to happen. Maybe they are just going to run Biden. Maybe that is just kind of the most boring story. But I was even trying to factor in how that might play into the cards, because essentially Newsom appointed a Kamala ally to the Senate. And that could be incredibly powerful. I mean, imagine if this new lady is soon to be, you know, the head of the Senate, right? Or given some very strategic um, positions in the Senate. I think Feinstein or Feinstein was head of the Judiciary Judiciary and Intel Committee in the Senate. This lady's now, I would assume, going to be taking her place, but I also think it's seniority focused. So maybe she just has to stop, start from the bottom. I'm not sure. Yeah, I could foresee between now and the special election that'll be hold, Newsom and the Democratic Party putting a lot of weight behind her um, to get her to pass Adam Schiff, because right now is last I look with both fundraising and in the polls, Adam Schiff is in first place uh, to run for that Senate seat. So I think her primary That'll focus in change. the short term and the the DNC, if this is their pick uh, over Adam Schiff, is going to be to get her as much spotlight as possible, uh, highlight her accomplishments as much as possible, and try to get her out in front of the microphone and use her interim senator seat is basically a campaign uh for the for the real election that's coming up that, that's why i think her focus is going to be in the short term long term i think she's going to be a, a killer for the dnc she she's proven herself of her track record that she's a mercenary you know her her shtick is that she's for the people with all these labor union uh projects that she belonged to but at the same time she's a lobbyist for uber and airbnb is uh, she really yep so so if you remember a couple of years ago, California was trying to pass a bill, I believe, that would W2 all of Uber's uh, drivers, which then they'd be entitled to benefits and social welfare uh, benefits from the state as well. And she was one of the ones that came on board with Uber to actually help squash that. So on no, one hand, she's she's helped raise the minimum wage for the average guy. But the other the other hand, she uh, kept millions of people in California as 1099s instead of W2s. So. And uh, kind of same thing with Airbnb, lobbying with them. The, the whole thing with Airbnb is uh, if you make the argument that now that that is a whole sector onto itself, uh, turning residential properties essentially into hotels, that you're squeezing out the, the little guy and killing the middle class's opportunity to, to buy into residential real estate, right? So uh, that would involve voters actually looking into things, though. So I, I think the DNC will do a good job keeping everything surface level for the average voter. And I, I could see her getting elected during the special election and staying senator. Because if they just wanted to keep her as an interim, he would have elicited a promise from her that she wouldn't run. And he didn't do that. He didn't do anything in return. So uh, I think they're setting her up for the long term. And it, it's a smart play. Again, she's only 45 years old. So compared to the rest of the DNC bench, she's young. It's very interesting, the political dynamics, because politics is all about uh, rewarding your network and building your network. Mm -hmm. And so you would have to think if you're a, a Katie Porter or a Adam Schiff or the other one's Barbara Lee, correct? Yeah. Um, you would have to think, I've done so much for the DNC, the Democratic Party here in California. It's finally my time to shine, right? You finally get to become a senator and then boom, out of left field, they choose somebody over you, right? And so a lot of people don't understand those political dynamics and they don't understand that even within the UNA party, they're still infighting because everybody wants to be in control, right? It's Game so, of Thrones. 
It is. And so a lot of people always, one principle I try to always tell people is, is corrupt and evil as some of the powers that be are, you can always rely on them wanting to infight. And you even take that to like the, the next scale, in my opinion, you think that, you know, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Klaus Schwab, whoever the big demon evil guys are that are always in the news talking about, you always think they're running the show, they're on coots, they're all collaborating. A lot of times they're still competing with one another. They sometimes find incentives that allow them to work together on a few things, but they still might hate each other on others. And that goes for even geopolitical relationships. I mean, at some points we work well with China and at other points we're really at odds and we're increasingly more and more at odds with them. You see the exact same dynamics within the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, where a lot of times people can simply especially in America, Americans are cheap, right? People can very easily be bought off. Um, and so, yeah, I think this new lady is going to be a mover and shaker because she's connected to all the donors. And Emily just has a huge media empire. So talk about controlling the narrative. I mean, just having media behind you. Um, I liked your point, though, that Gavin Newsom didn't make her swear to step down. So that is a good hint that she's definitely going to be running it for the long term because that was his condition that, hey, I don't want to get in the middle of this. Um, I wonder what bets on the back end Newsom made uh, for that pick because, you know, he must have he must have said, OK, I'll appoint her, but here's what I want in return. I just wonder what that is. So. Uh, if you want to talk about infighting, man, uh, Good time to segue to Gates and uh, McCarthy. Yeah, why you want to touch on that? Yeah, I posted a TikTok yesterday about um, Gates' va uh, motion to vacate in which McCarthy has two days to respond and how it's essentially in a lot of ways a win-win for Gates. And then I love bringing up um, that Gates and AOC, you know, Ocasio-Cortez, actually align on certain things, and that's the whole horseshoe theory idea right but they were all both saying even if they're even if you want to argue that they're both corrupt or even if aoc is corrupt or whatever you want to say they're both trying to pass a bill to stop congress from investing in the stock market and so aoc who's the epitome of the progressive caucus which is about 100 103 members of the house said she would totally back uh removing mccarthy so if you get 103 dems there were 91 republicans who didn't vote for the budget and then you had about seven people who voted no on the budget. Then you had about seven people who didn't vote at all. I think that added up to 201, uh, which means they just need around 19, maybe 20 more, who would most likely come from the Republican or Democrat side, um, to vote no on him being speaker. And then it's like, once he's not speaker, my feeling is, I don't understand why Matt Gates doesn't just doesn't become speaker himself but i don't know what the logic is behind that so what which way do you think the vote goes good question i saw most recently the ap news that and by the time we publish this episode in a couple of hours uh we'll probably already know the answer to the question but i think it all depends i would not be i it's such a lame answer i wouldn't be surprised if he stays i wouldn't be surprised if he goes the biggest deal is what Republicans actually want and what Democrats are willing to do. Are Democrats willing to just throw the Republican Party in chaos? Do they do they like the media coverage of this and it takes the media off of them for a few things? Does it allow them to blame Republicans for certain things? I mean, I think they currently are having their own issues in the Senate, right? Um, I don't know. So <clears throat> as far as the situation goes, I see it as strategically dumb, strategically but dumb, but principally correct uh, as far as what Gates is doing. So, and yeah, why strategically dumb? That's interesting. Just timing or? Uh, I think it makes the Republican Party look extremely weak and chaotic, right? It gives the Democrats some power uh, over the situation because they obviously know that uh, they're going to be the ones that determine whether he's in or out McCarthy. Uh, principally, though, it's it's good and it could potentially be good for the long run, depending on how things play out. 
uh, that Gates and the Freedom Caucus can now say, look, when we say something, we mean it. Like we're, we're going to follow through. And therefore, the next time, if presented with an opportunity the next time uh, that they make a threat, it will be taken seriously. Uh, I'm really surprised that McCarthy was not smart enough to make a deal with Gates and give him a little bit of what he wanted, uh, change the spending bill, knowing that the Senate's going to kick it back down anyways. So why not make the deal with Gates? Why not give Gates what he wants and avoid this vote in the first place? That's the part that confuses me and makes me wonder who has what over McCarthy, that he would not make that deal in light of what's coming. Because I think the vote goes in Gates' favor. Uh, but when I said strategically this could be dumb, is who takes McCarthy's spot? Just because McCarthy's out doesn't mean that Gates gets somebody that will be more likely to work with him. It could actually be somebody that's worse, right? So Democrats are not his friends. If they help him, it's going to be to sow chaos, not because they agree with him. Uh, and that's also going to piss off the neocon conservatives, which then could really come after Gates. Uh, and like I said, he doesn't know that the pick after McCarthy is going to be any better than McCarthy. So, well, I mean, there's a lot of things we don't know as insiders, right? But yeah. I can tell you this one, I actually disagree. I think this is good timing because if you want to oust the speaker, it has to be around something around the budget. The budget's yeah. only passed a few times a year. So if he doesn't do this now, that pushes it into next year, right? And so if you push it into next year, the timing might be worse because by next year, we'll know whoever the president is. Right. So it's best to do this now because also the media and momentum's on his side to say, look at what McCarthy's funding. Right. right. So I think now is the best time. As far as division, division is all media and marketing. Right. And so when you're in power, uh, if anything doesn't get done, it's always going to look like division. Right. But I think the bet is now's the perfect time because it's right before or during the budget. It's right before the holidays and the holiday recess. The bet of someone coming in worse than McCarthy is always is always there. But what's fun is seeing the jockeying because you have to think, well, who's powerful in Congress, right? Um, I don't think also, I don't think the Senate was going to say no to the budget. I think they were going to pass it because at the end of the day, they got their Ukraine funding. Um, I think they might have argued and maybe made some comments, but I bet you, I bet you they still would have signed it. Uh, and I, my gut tells me that's the only reason McCarthy fought so hard, uh, well, is because the neocons and everyone kind of for that pro war mindset was like, all right, let's, let's give them a little, but everybody suck it up and let's just get it through. Right. So I, I should have been more clear when I say the Senate would kick it back down. What I meant was if McCarthy actually came back and gave concessions to Gates and the Freedom Caucus, oh. then he can pass that buck and say, well, it wasn't me. I gave you what you wanted. Senate kicked it back. So that would have been a way to obfus obfuscate. Ah, can't say it. Obfuscate. Obf yeah, edit that for me. Awesome. <laughs> so, obfuscate. Yeah, but, no. Uh, I get that, you. I got gotcha. you. Like, as McCarthy is handling the situation this way. Now, the one question that's going to be tough for the Democrats is if they want to side with Matt Gates, they're having to side with the boogeyman that they've been demonizing for the last several years as a alt-right, Nazi-adjacent boogeyman, right? But so, it doesn't matter, though, right? Because they just – it's not really siding. They're just being like, yeah, we hate McCarthy. Well, like, I don't think it'll hurt them. That. They'll have huh? to clearly message that, that we're not siding with uh, Matt Gates. We're just throwing a hand grenade in the room. For, for I don't the, think it matters because Democrats aren't in power, so they don't really care. Like, I don't think your average Democratic voter cares at all about, okay, the Republicans are lost McCarthy. And we you do have a point. Matter. You do have a point. Most of them have no clue what's even going on in Congress right now. So, <laughs> like, I really, yeah, I really don't think. And, and again, I think everything's focused on the presidential debate. Uh, Yes. Like your average, your average person probably doesn't even know how their congressman voted on the budget. Yeah. Realistically. Right. So all we're seeing is Gates ousting McCarthy. When Gates ousts McCarthy, only nerds like you and me are going to be like, who voted? Everyone else is going to see the headline, the House ousted McCarthy. 
you know, yeah. and they're not going to go, oh, and think, oh, man, the Dems helped him. Why did the Dems help him? Or, oh, the Dems sided with McCarthy. Why'd they do that? You know what I mean? They're just going to see the headline and they're going to go, oh, McCarthy's still in power. Okay. Oh, he was ousted. Okay, what next? True. True. So it's it's hard because we have to remember that uh, we're more interested in this stuff than maybe, yeah. you know, your, your average consumer, your average voter, and for good reason. Um, but... I think what's interesting for both of these situations is for both McCarthy, Gates, and Newsom, the principle applies that politics is all about favors and money. And so McCarthy trying to keep his seat is going to be figuring out who owes him favors, which is what the whip of the House does, the whip to whip votes, which is normally the right-hand man of the speaker. That's what he does. He's the boogeyman. He's the bully. He's the one who says, do you want us to fund your primary opponent? We have the dirt on you. Do you want us to leak it to the media? All that stuff. But Matt Gates, because he was close to Trump, uh, because he's just been in Congress long enough, has built up his own network of favors and knowledge and people. And I yeah. think he's going to draw upon that. Uh, Newsom and the principle that he's applied to, you know, getting this new senator in power, it's all favoritism and it's all money and it's all cash flow. So yeah. it will be interesting to see. Um how it plays out, because as we speak, I mean, McCarthy's going forward with the vote. So now it's going to be everybody figuring out, OK, what's going to happen? Um, and to me, it's just it's just going to be fun. And if no budget gets approved, we at the time of the deadline had 45 days. So maybe by now we might only have like 42 days. But that puts us just in time for Thanksgiving for the government shutdown. Yeah. So, again, principally. 100% the right thing to do. You know, you, you look at his interviews, he's been making the point of, we've been doing this for decades now where we essentially hold soldier, you know, military pay hostage. We hold, you know, we, we let people think, oh, will I get my social security? We do this every so many uh, years so that we can pass all this bullshit. So I think what he's doing principally is 100% right. I just haven't, walk that dog all the way yet uh, strategically if this is going to pay off for him but i'll say this he is of all the freshmen and uh young gun congressmen he is probably the most impressive that i've seen i've changed my opinion about him uh, as far as like how intelligent he is and and so i'm gonna i'm gonna say strategically he probably knows what he's doing because he's proven time and time again that he he knows how to move the pieces on the chessboard. Like you said, look at the network he's built. Look at some of the plays he's made that have paid off. And just when I see him talk now, whether it's intelligence committee type stuff, I had to go the other day and look. I'm like, did this was this guy like an intel guy? Like, how does he know this stuff that he's spouting off? Who, Matt Gates? Oh, Matt Gates. You can tell he does his homework. You know, he, he doesn't just sit and, and put it as a feather in his cap. He actually tries. So, yeah, he was uh, spouting off some Air Force 3-1 stuff the other day. I was like, this guy's just a lawyer. So yeah. uh, he, he's really impressed me. Uh, so I guess I'll see that uh, he probably knows what he's doing as far as this uh, taking it to McCarthy. And if anything, he wants more earned media and attention for when he decides to file to run for Florida's governor, uh, which yeah. will be very interesting. So, and the... It's really low threat for him, right? Because of who his constituents are in his district. He's pretty secure. So he's not going anywhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. E even if he were to not win governor, he'll still be congressman. And cool, his man. father, his father may be rerunning for Senate in the Florida legislature, uh, which would be very funny and very interesting. Cool. But well, I think hey, that's all we got for today. So thanks for yeah. coming on, Richard. Uh, I'm sure I'll be having you back on again soon. Cool. Look forward to it.